I, I'm Brian, um, CTO of Neuron Sphere. And uh, I do, I live out in the countryside. If you could see out the back window of my house, it's a big cornfield. Um, it's very quiet. The sound of bugs is sort of deafening. Um, but today we're going to kind of talk about the opposite of that. We're going to talk about source code and how do we organize our source code and why do I think that's so important. And um, I really came to this idea, right? Like your source code is cattle, not pets. There's an interesting discussion in the infrastructure space that sort of, you know, coined that term. And I really like it, right? I think uh, by looking at how we organize our source code, we'll solve some things. So what do we want? And, and this one's kind of simple. I think all, you know, software engineering management kind of has this same want list, right? I want the developers to uh, to think less and to go faster. Um, and, and really, I, I want to think less about some specific things, right? Maybe I'll use nicer words. I want to reduce the cognitive burden. Um, but there's a work cycle that developers go through kind of every day. And, and whether you're a you know, firmware developer or middle tier, you're developing in Kubernetes or you're up at the analytics tier, we're sort of the same cycle we're going to go through. And um, if we can make that easier, you know, that that's better, right? Um, we'd like to make it easier to break Conway's law. So we'll mention that a little bit. And and this vague, like, we'd like to produce higher quality software. So um, we are going to assume we're doing N of things, right? So like as a team, we're producing you know, multiple APIs, we're producing multiple dashboards, we're producing multiple services, we're producing multiple data models, right? So what is this thing we do, right? You go to the developers and you say, hey, I, I want to make a change. So they got to go find where they're supposed to make the change. And then they've got to build, run, test it, package it, publish it, deploy it, integration test it once it's deployed, right? Maybe come back, rinse, lather, repeat. This feels very general across programming languages and and architecture technologies, there's a whole bunch of variants that all fit into this standard flow. So, you know, if we want to go faster and think less and, and break Conway's law and, and make higher, we want to get all these goals. We're going to impact this cycle by organizing our source code in a better way. Right. And and really, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. What this looks like is we're going to make a, probably more small repositories than you're potentially used to seeing. Um, we're going to talk about a component-based development approach. You know, everything is code. And so if everything is code, let's talk about, you know, really formally, how do we organize that? Um, let's talk about versioning, dependency management, packaging consistency. And, and if you can do those things well, then I, I think the how CLIs work for you and the CLIs you can develop as a platform team, those really change. So let's look at Conway's law. You know, it says any... and. You can't completely break it, right? But, you know, it's good marketing. Any organization that designs systems produces designs that, you know, kind of look like their communication structure. And that look like their communication structure is really interesting, right? Often looks like their org chart. And so to say we want to do some anti-Conway software, we're going to start with a, a lot of small repositories that are all on an even playing field. And we're going to focus on artifact interaction patterns with you know orthogonal interactions and tools rather than thinking about and organizing by the org chart. So what is what does this look like, right? Like if you saw one of these. This isn't an uncommon app stack, right? We've got an end user of our little web app. We've got an analytics consumer. You know, really quick here, you know, we've got some extraction jobs. We have this apps repo because we have an apps team, right? So they've got their mono repo and their way of doing things. And then we've got this data team. They've got some code. And they've got some dashboards. They're doing, you know, dashboards as code, maybe. And um, they've got some staging table schemas in here and some extraction jobs. These these folks have their own extraction jobs, right? In different repository, different way of talking about it. They don't even call it an extraction job. Then the infra team, you know, very different. They say, oh, we're infra, we're different. So we have our own repo. They have two or three, actually. You can see logical dependencies between these things. You can see runtime dependencies, these things, but it's kind of a mishmash. And if you just look at the code, it's really kind of hard to see what's going on. Um, so what would this look like if we said, you know, before and after? We we can run a, a really logical transformation that says, look, all of these components can be grouped into smaller sections by the kind of things that they are. We're going to add version numbers. Uh, so this, you know, this view of the repositories we're going to talk about, here's the version that they are. You'll note the versions are expressed really consistently, 
right? There's a lot of good joking about, you know, nobody does semantic versioning, but like even doing it basically and consistently across, you know, ingestion jobs, our API layer, our transfer, you know, our dashboards over here that rely on our data warehouse schemas. We can look at this in, and see a, a runtime dependency chart that's very clear. Um, we understand the code dependencies. We can suddenly do versioning across these different technologies, right? And that's that's really kind of getting ahead, but that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to say, look, these, these code repositories, we're going to talk about those as architectural quantum. And, and, you know, everything goes into Git now, right? Everything is code, and that's a great baseline. But it isn't nearly enough because we have this diverse architecture that's growing. And we looked at this previous drawing and we've got all these different layers and components. It does exist as a series of self-referenceable components that you can tie together as artifacts. We just don't often formally manage it that way, right? We don't put a lot of care necessarily in, into starting at the beginning of, of repo management. And, and so then you get to a haphazard collection of artifacts and artifact control and dependency management gets very challenging. But underneath it, you know, all these technologies, all the different programming languages, they provide mechanisms for reuse. They provide mechanisms for inclusion. They provide mechanisms for reference. Uh, you know, many of them, if you if you talk about, you know, programming languages and, and, and all kinds of other tools, support the idea of versioning, packaging, dependencies, and, and artifacts that come out of this process. What does this look like, right? You know, main.source, there's no programming language here. Very intentionally, we've got some logic, some persistence, maybe dependency declarations. We build it, we get a program. We add some other stuff, right? Like the program by itself, the source code's not enough, so we need documentation. We're going to add this critical version identifier. We're going to run it through packaging. Now we have distribution artifact. We're going to put that into a repository. It was a really clean, straightforward, you know, kind of this is how we build software. But you know, we don't often see, you know, when we look at the the normal repo structures, that traceability from, from repo to artifact over on the left-hand side isn't nearly as clear as it is on the right. So let's say we were going to do this, right? Like what does a basic standard repo look like? The the very minimum would be, you know, the very MVP. We, we would say, well, we're going to, we're going to create a metadata folder. I mean, you could put this stuff at the root if you wanted. I have a, a personal affliction. I like to see a nice clean root with as few individual files as possible and a handful of subdirectories. So we're going to create a metadata directory. Um, and in here, we're going to put a manifest and a version file. We'll talk about what those look like. And, uh, you know, it's source code. So here's source, general ideas, source and technology facet. Um, so let's assume this is uh, this is Go. We're going to have some code, and then we're going to have some tests. Note, you know, unit testing goes with a particular technology, and, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of another kind of testing and where does that fit in here. The manifest in this in this idea is a contract. It's a simple idea. Uh, it's a contract that says here's how I interact with other repositories. You know, any individual programming language has this idea, right? Python says, hey, I can express a list of dependencies. Java has a way to list dependencies. Rust, everybody does this. But they all have their own little kind of library and repository and artifact manager way. We'd like to be able to do this for the repositories themselves. So we say, hey, here's the manifest. We're going to use that to do inter-repository dependency management. Um, we're going to have some platform tooling, maybe. You know, we're going to talk in a minute about, you know, we're going to have a lot of repos. We might have some useful tools. So that manifest becomes a contract, an interaction point with platform tooling. Um, it also becomes an interaction point with a deployment environment. So you can put, you know, runtime dependencies and things in there and, and say, look, when, when this repo deploys into this kind of environment, uh, you know, I'm looking for a database. I don't necessarily know everything about the database you're going to provide me. But given that you you meet this logical specification, you know, that's all I need. This idea of, you know, deploying an application into an environment that you know, provides some other connectivity and services, pretty, pretty old school. Um, but that manifest says, look, let's let's do it at the repo level, regardless of what kind of technology we're using. Um, this version file, 
really the version file is a touchstone. It says what version is this snapshot of the source right now. Um, it lets you do some interesting things with the branches. It gives you a great place for tools to interact. Um, the layout itself, the file system layout here, begins to form a contract, right? You know, orthogonal platform tooling will be a lot easier to develop if you have a very consistent repository layout, including, you know, when a tool does a build, where does it put temporary files? You know, all the tools should kind of work the same way. I think, you know, that was a very MVP. You know, if I had my, my druthers, you know, basic standard repo, we might include some documentation. Um, so I, I like a, a docs folder. You know, I'm a big believer in well-commented stuff. By the way, we're going to add some specific stuff here. So this this repo now, we're going to have some documentation uh, that tells us about the you know the Docker container and the Java stuff and the Protobuf stuff that we have, right? Because those things are clearly you know each have their own ability to put comments in. But above that, you know, how are they organized together? Why did I choose these three technologies? There's always a need for the overriding documentation at the repository level. Same thing for tests, right? So this is the idea of an integration test separate from any of the individual subcomponents. So Java has some unit tests. I, I'm not sure how to unit test protobuf. I suppose you could. I don't, I don't know what that would look like. Um, you know, and then maybe you're going to compile all this, put it in a container. Now I'm going to have some integration tests. And, 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 you know, that should be standard in my repo layout as well. Um, you know, we kind of took a shortcut here and we said, well, this is by technology. And so we said, you know, well, Docker or Java, but, you know, what about things like JSON, right? Like I've got a collection of JSON files that meet some schema for gateway configuration. Um, in that scenario, right, it's more about this idea of a facet. So we're going to say, look, I've got a thing called gateway configs that I like to manage. They need to be versioned. They have got dependencies with other things, right? Like sometimes the gateway config goes into the Docker file, right? Goes into the Docker container, right? So even though it's just JSON files, gateway config gets its own thing. Similar here, right? We have the standard Python. Okay, well, we make libraries out of this. Um, but if we're doing some Terraform, Python, CDK, you know, technically this is Python source files too, but it's a different tool chain. It's a very different process to, to produce the artifacts out of here, right? So, you know, two different kinds of Python, very different facets from a technology standpoint. We talk about this repository having four facets, uh, not, not two or three. What does this look like at scale? Just like as an example, um, this looks like a bunch of CLIs maybe, which is great because we're going to talk about CLIs in a minute. It's the next subject. Um, if you have a whole bunch of little repositories that all behave in similar ways, you kind of expand these and you say, look, yep, they all, whoop, you know, they all look very similar. It starts to give you this feeling of portability, right? Like I could look at HMD CLI Helm and if I knew what Helm was and I knew how CLIs worked, I could probably go dig in here, start to make an effective change, right? And that's really you know, back to what we're trying to do with engineers, we're trying to make it faster and easier to find where I'm supposed to make a change, make a change, update tests, update documentation, build it, prove that it works. How does it integrate with the rest of the world, right? This consistency, really, you can see it here, starts to drive that. So now let's talk about CLIs a little bit more, right? I said we we're going to talk about repositories and CLIs. If you're going to end up with a bunch of repositories that are very standard structure, this idea of how to build a repository ought to be a question that nobody has to ask anymore, right? You can go into the repository and you just say build, and that should just work. Um, and, and I recognize that a lot of people say, well, you know, if you use a standard make file with a standard list of commands, it's that, that, but that's still a standard make file and, and you're relying a lot on people to have to do things. I don't, I don't know that you should have to have a build file at all. Um, we have, you know, have an example of a few hundred repositories where there's no build files. Everything runs off the manifest and you just say build in a given repo. And because it's standards based and it understands the flavors that are in there, it's able to properly delegate through, build the right subcomponents. Um, developers don't, don't have to, to work at it or really think about it, which is very handy. Um, for a given technology, maybe I want to go do some packaging, right? So like Java should have a packaging command. A good CLI in this strategy, you know, more generally, is going to wrap some technology into a consistent lifecycle interface. 
what does that look like, right? Like, as if you if you started doing this for your team and you're, a, you know, primarily a Java shop, maybe a little bit of Python, apparently the database layer, you start to develop this matrix, right? So organization X, I have a technology facet list. Here's the things. Remember, I said we're going to do N of things. Here's the list of things I know how to build, right? If you said, hey, could you go build me a Java library? I, I have a couple templates for different variations of that. I have a build command. I have a package command. I have a publish command. You know, I, I don't have an int test command directly for Java, right? But but I do for, for Docker, fine. Um, for protobuf, maybe I do protobufs, right? I've got a template. I got build command. Packaging and publishing don't really make sense, right? I'm going to take the output of some compilation and, and run it into some other things. Um, so those are start out. But what you can start to see is as I add technologies, right? Maybe I've got some ETL configs. Maybe I've got some snowflake tables and views. Um, these are cool technologies, but shouldn't I have a, you know, a snowflake deployment script that when I say, you know, build, it doesn't do anything. But when I say package and publish and deploy, well, those are really rational ideas, right? But if I wanted to have 10 different repositories that all had, you know, different tables and views, I shouldn't need to reinvent that wheel. As a matter of fact, the, the Snowflake team, you know, ought to be able to create this CLI for me. They ought to add, you know, common command line parameters and options, maybe even logging, right, to trace usability of their own tool. And I, as a developer, you know, I just say, hey, I go into my repo X here. I know I've got some Snowflake. I say Snowflake publish. Right? That should just do what it's supposed to do um, because I've inverted things, right? Now I can allow teams of experts across the organization to build CLIs that can intersect N independent repositories. And really, I can start to build collections of repositories with subcomponents, right? So if I wanted to start doing this now, right? Like you're like your soul, you're like ready to go. Um, but it seems a little risky. You don't want to break any of your real code. Well, you could go make a bunch of new ones and, and probably some that are really useful, right? Like would be useful. So pick a few facets, pick some things that you know you need a few of, right? So like maybe you need, you know, maybe a huge pile of Python code and, and you've really been itching for a while to like rip some of it out and make some libraries and be able to unit test those better, right? You may as well figure out like what does your CLI look like for Python libraries? You know, what would your standard repository look like for your organization? How, how broad do you think that could be? How, how simple could you make it? And, and how broadly applicable could you get it to be? Could you start building some libraries? Because that'll get you to the next step, which is, you know, how do we affect existing code? Maybe uh, you know, Docker images is a great second. Um, Docker is, you know, phenomenal technology, uh, really pervasive. Building it, you know, presents lots of interesting long command lines and lots of, of opportunity for organizational standardization. Um, so good ability to like build templates and cleaner Docker pipelines that are super standardized, probably a great second. Um, documentation is diagrams as code. I have a, a, a personal happiness for those. So that's a great third idea. These are all new things that you could go build in small repos, kind of get used to building CLIs that interact with repos. You could build some layered templates, right? So you could reproduce more of these things. Maybe you could build some infrastructure as code modules, right? Like there's lots of reusability options there. Now, once you kind of get used to the idea and you've built a couple little things, then you scale, right? Then you go attack your existing legacy code. You can apply this to existing repos. And, and really it's a, it's a judgment call where you start chopping bits out. Um, but you want to find places in your architecture that are causing release management challenges or, or like deeply indicative of Conway's law. Right. So like these two repos are owned by these two teams. And we, we got to break that up into like 15. And here's why. Right. S same two teams. But we're going to break it up because the release process is going to get a lot better. Um, maybe we need to extract a data model. Right. So like maybe all the open API files are hidden down in with a bunch of web app code. And there's a real synchronization problem with the folks in the database tier. So we're going to move those out into a separate repo and do some refactoring and create some dependencies around like a real package set of data models. There's a lot of ways to apply this. You know, it is it's just refactoring with a target that is these nice reusable little modules, right? So common responses to this. Um, I know we're going to have some time for Q and A, but you know, want to nail a list of these, right? Foo, 
right? Like Foo with big, there's lots of big companies or big examples in this space uses a model repo. That is true. There are a number of successful examples of it. I think in a lot of cases, and I've asked this question a number of times and of a bunch of people, right? Like even places that are saying, you know, woo woo, everything in a mono repo, like, you know, then there's an asterisk and they go, well, except for the other 12 that are over here. Um, mono repos are really neat when you contemplate MA of, of complex other code bases and languages. So you, you can do mono repo and, and there's people that are successful with it. I think realistically, it's probably harder to be successful. Uh, it's harder to reason about, and it's easier to take shortcuts. Um, another reason, I don't like microservices. There is nothing in what I've talked about here, nothing in a highly repo organization that says you need to do microservices. As a matter of fact, if you wanted to build a great big monolith, you'd be importing a bunch of libraries and a bunch of different routines and a bunch of different other binaries, right? You need a bunch of components at version numbers with dependencies, whether you're deploying microservices or big monoliths. Factually, most people are somewhere in between, right? Like this is very useful if you're going to do kind of good size domain driven microservices where there's lots of reuse um, and lots of deployment complexity. This, this does help, um, but you don't have to. Generated repos get stale, right? Like you saw what looked like a lot of like snapshotted code and, and you can look at that and you go, oh, you know, I can just feel some staleness in there. Maybe. Um, the flip side of this is this might be the best opportunity to make and keep and apply and update new standards, right? So like I have a snapshot that says, you know, template that says, this is the canonical way we do Python libraries. And I go make 40 of those and we go for the next year and a bunch of people write a bunch of code and we make two or three changes to that template. It is easier to go to those repositories, run the template into a branch and do a diff you could methodically figure out exactly how, you know, what kind of Delta application of the new template would look like, right? So if you want to contemplate standards, even at the code level, at the architecture, the structure level, this is easier because you're using a bunch of generated repository structures. Um, dev team should have the flexibility to define their own repo layouts. I, I don't think that's effective necessarily. I think Technology teams should certainly collaborate to define what goes in them, right? I think there's this whole, how do you make a facet? How do you make a CLI that goes with it? I think there's room for differentiation in there with governance, but it's not a free-for-all, right? The intent is to give you the ability to mix and match components with tools that have been pre-vetted so you can go faster. And here's how you can add your oddball. But I don't I don't believe that you need absolute flexibility to be, to be effective. Um, you need tooling for this. You do. You absolutely need tooling for this. Um, you need tooling for mono repos too. Uh, yet I would make an argument, and you know we've got some tooling. I've played with some tooling um, that it's pretty straightforward because you can do it in flat structures or sections of flat structures, right? Like you don't you don't have to you don't have to contemplate as much recursion in, in terms of like hierarchical build. And and so yeah, you're going to need tooling either way. I feel like this tooling in some ways is a little bit more straightforward. It's almost always resolves a sort of list processing of a list of repositories. Um, this doesn't solve any problems that a mono repo does. It, it's true. Um, and we've kind of looked at experiments and, and overlaying one over the same code base in the local disk. Um, again, I think this makes it easier um, to go to the straightforward path. And that's Right. That's what platform engineering is about, right? Like it's supposed to be easier to do the right thing. It's supposed to be easier to, you know, the default decision is supposed to take you to a better place. That's the happy path. Small repos of components and artifact types that have known interaction patterns, far easier to reason about than where in the mono should I go add some directory, right? Um, finally, this is painful with Git flow. Maybe, again, um, you know, we got to talk about what do you mean for Git flow and why and what do you need it for? So if the conversation is, hey, you know, I want to go change the database, I'm going to go change the API layer, and I'm going to change the API spec, and I'm going to change the client, I'm going to go change the web page, and I'm going to add one field to that whole stack. And uh, I want to wrap all that up in one PR. And in a mono, I can do that. It's true. Um, and if it takes you days, you know, to, to read that PR, then I can see that this would be concerning. If it looks like you're going to pump each one of these changes um, and wait, you know, three days for each layer, uh, I would argue there's other process problems, architecture problems, organization challenges there. Um, 
this is doable with Git flow with really fast pull requests. Um, on the flip side, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, uh, it, you know, number eight, all the way at the bottom there with Git flow. If you're interested in trunk based development, if you're interested in, you know, aggressive multi environment uh, CI CD, this lends itself to that very, very well. Um, so, you know, if if big pull requests and waiting days for PRs and, you know, not seeing deep integration testing for days after, like if those are your challenges, this gets you to really fast little builds with lots of integration testing, right? Um, I'm not going to drain this list. Uh, I will talk about, you know, I, I, I we've looked at, you know, a number of different repos. I've looked at, you know, lots of open source code. I've looked at lots of code in all kinds of different languages over the years. When you take this approach, in my experience, when you take this approach, you end up with a larger code base that's cleaner. Um, it's harder to take shortcuts with dependencies. It, it's harder to do little weird hacks in your build process with, oh, just copy these things over here, right? Like it forces you to solve some problems at a fundamental level. And at this point, you know, like getting a library server so you can have private Python packages or private whatevers. Like that's not a huge hurdle anymore. That shouldn't feel big to set up for most people. Um, so I, I I make this assertion, you know, it's hard to, but like, I think that just, just doing this produces a more modular, maintainable, definitely more testable ecosystem, um, you know, regardless of your deployment architecture, regardless of your cloud, regardless of, you know, I think if you're, if you're using this to make fat client, um, as a matter of fact, we use this to make an electron client it still worked better, right? Like we broke a mono into a bunch of pieces because it was it was faster. Um, I think it's easier. I'm going to skip number two. You know, it's, it's a lot about de runtime dependency analysis, right? So I want to deploy this app, but I can't deploy it unless this database exists. I, I think that is really useful as a given the fact that almost all of our repositories now are more than code that's going to run in one memory space, right? Like almost everything we're building is distributed systems now. And so we're going to build lots of distributed systems. We've got to have a <clears throat> kind of a, a runtime dependency expression that really crosses the boundaries uh, of those languages and ecosystems, right? So this, you know, I think this gets us to the beginning of that. Um, you know, talk about workload separation and how do I separate the expression of a desire for resources versus, you know, some other provider that's providing you know, databases or clusters. Um, it's easier to perform meta analysis on the code base. I've done this, right? Um, I want to do X to all the Python libraries. Uh, I want to find out how much documentation I have for all the components that look like this. I want to add a new kind of documentation, a new template to all the components that look like this, right? Like doing this meta analysis and sort of group uh, actions on a bunch of repositories is, is, is easier because they're in this parallel consistent structure. Um, I think developers are more likely to experiment bigger and faster um, when they're not scared of like, and even though you can make a branch, you can make a branch and you're still kind of like polluting the main code base, right? The ability to just like, I want new this, I want new this, I want new this, stand a bunch of stuff up, build it, go deploy it somewhere, take a look at it. You don't like it. You just throw those repos away. Um, there's a feeling of safety there. I think that is, uh, uh, you know, I think pushes for, easier experiments to happen. I know it, it, it feels that way, right? Um, developers do move across a larger code base faster. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about full stack and you know, we're always talking about, remember, go back to the beginning, make this easier and faster. Allowing people to move, you know, up and down the stack and across, um, you know, the big problem is they go land in a new set of repos. And the first thing they say is, well, how do I build it? Where is it documented? How do I package it? How do I, you know, the more consistency there is, the more they can focus on what's different, right? And like things like building and packaging shouldn't be that different at this point. Um, conversely, this, this provides a great way to introduce new technologies. But like it feels like a lot of standardization, like ah, things are locked down and et cetera. But this is a great way to say, hey, listen, I have this new idea and I can explain to you how it fits into the ecosystem. You know, here's how the source code looks like underneath slash source. Here's what a good one looks like. Here's the CLI. We only need the build command and the package command, right? Or we only need build and an integration test, right? Like you can now controllably say, this is what it takes to bring a new technology in. And I can look at and begin to cognitively understand how it's going to affect the developers, right? Starting with, it's probably not a radically new CLI to learn. 
probably fits right in the existing ecosystem, right? Like you've kind of done things consistently. Um, you can also do standard wrapper CLIs and, and use these for governance and controls, right? So we say, hey, you know, when we build Docker, um, by default, if you're running it on your on your local machine, it only builds for your local architecture. But if you're running in the cloud, it uh, you know on the build server, it automatically runs for like three of them. Um, as an engineer, I don't have to think about that. The the people who wrote the CLI that said build Docker, they handle that and they keep that maintained. And this is really some interesting orthogonal impact, right? Like you can maintain these tools, and as the tools are upgrading, you know, and the repos are changing over time you're forcibly bringing these tools up to, you know, being built with the latest and greatest, right? So there's a lot of interesting like, benefit in making the CLI and the structures really orthogonal. Um, we talked about this, right? Pairs well with trunk-based development. So a couple of quick drawings, right? Like other quick drawings. Um, this one is some, some detail on the left and some uh, abbreviated repos on the right, but uh, these are like real repos and the way the repos are depending on each other at, at runtime, right? So this is a, a an active architecture drawing um, that also reflects the you know the code. This was pulled out of the manifests. Um, this is a bigger one, kind of the same thing, slightly different rendering, uh, but this is a big runtime uh, dependency chart. And each one of these things, if you zoom way in on this when you get the PowerPoint afterwards, um, each one of these things is like a repo name. And in, in many cases, an instance name with some version and specific version information. Um, so this, you know, it, it starts to scale, I guess, pretty well. Um, I'm watching the time. We're at 32 minutes there. So I'm, I'm right on it. And uh, I look forward to questions. Amazing. Thank you so much, Brian, for a very energetic presentation and session. <laughs> really enjoyed it and uh, people can people can watch it on half speed i fit right like i'm i'm gonna go i got 30 minutes no you had those expressions you know like and here is there 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 <laughs> i really loved it uh guys just to reiterate uh you can ask questions in the q a section and we got the first one let's go with it how do you map out and then draw the dependencies um i guess from which direction right if you're doing an extraction right you've got a big big one and you're trying to pull it out um you know it, it's a little bit of like doing your own code analysis and doing a dependency diagram on like the larger code base to see you know there's a refactoring activity to figure out like how to rip out a certain subsection that is the easiest um so there's no flawless automated way to do that on the source side on the on the target side, on the once you've got them in poly repos with little manifest files with dependencies, it's really easy to walk those manifest files, turn that into a graph, you know, kind of turn that into whatever object structure you want, um, and and look at the dependencies. So we, you know, we visualize the dependencies in a couple of different ways. Those drawings that I showed, uh, let me pull pull back. These are are actually um, generated from uh from looking at some code so this is like walking through this one is walking through manifests to produce the drawing this one's actually calling a service that produced a drawing um but it's the same logical idea of like once you have the manifests it's it's a really straightforward dependency model yeah i would get lost <laughs> i mean work. i don't get look i don't get lost and i'm like the dumbest one around so like it's it's I promise this uh, makes it easy. Do you use specific tooling for this? Do we use specific tooling for this? Yes. Um, we have developed some tooling for this. I, I, a little, right? Like I get to pitch, I guess, a tiny bit. A Neuron Sphere, the little logo on the bottom. That's the company I work for. I'm the co-founder. Um, and, and a bunch of this was built with our tooling. We've got open source tooling that you could go download and and build a bunch of these repos and see how this works locally and the presentation is not exactly how our tooling works, right? Like the presentation says stuff that's even cooler than what our tooling does. Um, so you might find it lacking in, in a few places, but yeah, there's a really close correlation between these drawings and how this works. The one on the bottom is a production view. The one on the top is a theoretical design view. Um, hope that hope that answered the question. <laughs> 
Yeah, very humble. Uh, <laughs> uh, what would a manifest JSON look like, for example, just to get an idea from what information uh, they contain? Yeah. Um, we give you some examples too. If you go to the Neuron Sphere org on GitHub, there are some example repos, and there is a Neuron Sphere channel on YouTube, and there are some videos you can follow along with. So you can like generate a bunch of this stuff locally to look at the manifest files in the examples. You'll have to modify them through tutorials and stuff. Um, it's a combination of things. So some of it is like a description of here's what the code is, right? That's the the definition of a manifest is what's in the box, right? The next thing is, here's what I depend on. So there's an, a list of repositories and, and version numbers outbound that I depend on. This looks, frankly, very similar to like a Python dependency list or a Java dependency list or whatever dependency list. Um, you know, there's sort of a Semver expression capability, um, but it's working at the repo level. And, and the repos will, you know, drag along all the rest of their artifacts. Then you see, and if you're familiar with Apache Maven, Right. Like I learned Maven was an old piece of software 20 years ago when I started using it. A lot of what this does is actually I learned it from Apache Maven. Right. So the idea that as a repository author, I might express a, a root package name or I might express like the default image that I want on the cover of the documentation. I put those in the manifest as well. And then people that write tools that know how to interact with the manifest are pulling data out. So that that manifest now becomes the communication mechanism for the, the, the repository author and the tool author. And, and it's kind of orthogonal there. But when you release a new CLI, part of what we release with the new CLI is, oh, by default, here's what it'll do. Like if there's nothing in your manifest, the CLI should still do useful things to your repo. If you want the CLI to do extra useful things, here's a bunch of extra stuff to add to the manifest that goes along with your repository. So it looks like plugin entries with configurations for plugins for a bunch of different tools, depending on, you know, what's in your repo. Makes sense. Uh, I see there are some questions on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, I guess the first one, could you use both a monolith and microservices in a hybrid fashion? Yes, uh, the deployment architectures that come out of this don't indicate monolith or microservices. So you could have an existing, you know, there's, we, we often make a relationship between, you know, in a mono repo, one big chunk of code, we would deploy, you know, create a monolith and then deploy a monolith, right? But you could have a mono repo, one big chunk of code and have you know, 800 deployment pipelines that come out of it and each produces a separate microservice on a different schedule. Similarly, you, know, you could use this poly repo strategy, lots of little tiny repos. You can have build pipelines that produce single huge binaries out of that, right? So you can produce a monolith or you can kind of go more one-to-one -one and say, oh, well, you know, these three little repos make this microservice. Um, the reality is I think you're often somewhere in between both on the organization side and on the deployment architecture side. And in, in that I think you, we have a couple of fat repos-ish, but not really. Like once you get used to working this way, when a repo gets too big, the developers split it kind of on their, like, on their own because it starts to get unwieldy. Um, so like the answer to the question is, yeah, you, you absolutely can support you, the entire range of deployment architectures. And, and you can even support, you know, kind of, subsets of, of code organization architectures. I think once you do this for a while, you don't want to. Also, you know, monolith versus microservices, like I don't, please note, I didn't express an intent opinion, an intent about which one is better. Yes, I see uh, somebody asked for the Neurosphere um, GitHub page. Alexander, thank you for sharing. I was also looking for it, but you uh, made it quicker. Uh, one more question. How strict are you uh, usually on the one artifact per repo rule? The more artifacts you have, the longer the dependency chains tend to become, which makes updates a pain. So there are diminishing returns. Yeah. Um, an interesting discussion we've had a few times because there is a subtlety there, right? In that it's not one artifact per repo. Um, it is often one artifact per technology facet per repo. So, so, so the subtlety there is, 
you know, I have one repo and I have a Java library and I have protobuf data models and I have a Docker container that's going to turn into a microservice. Uh, those three things, you know, in my universe all have the same release cycle. I don't want dependencies between them. They should always all have the same version number. So when that repo builds, it's actually going to produce three different artifacts. It's going to produce the bundle that comes out of the object model. It's going to produce the libraries that come out of the, the Java build. And it's going to produce the Docker container with everything in it, you know, ready for deployment. Like that's the default. You're going to get three artifacts out of the one and you don't have any external dependency, right? Like the dependencies wouldn't be between the pieces to make that. So it's more like if I wanted a repo and I wanted to have, you know, 12 microservices all under this, what that's where we start to say, okay, no, you're kind of breaking cardinality. Um, it, it's interesting because there's some real pros and cons to it, right? But, you, but ultimately we've, we've I scaled this pretty far a couple of times and the ability to, as long as you go one per facet, that seems to be like the right kind of middle ground. Um, as soon as you go multiple, it you get into the like recursive problem of what am I building? Cool. Um, one more question from the YouTube. Is the manifest taking care of the deployment? And I guess um, before that, uh, there were questions. How is the manifest file for the dependencies? How are you using that in the build process? So I guess they're all interconnected. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we use the manifest in the build process and we use the manifest in the deployment process. Um, and they're both pretty open, right? I mean, this, you know, this talk was designed to be very conceptual, right? So like conceptually, you can, you know, build the manifest out of XML and do what you want in your Jenkins server. Um, we we have a build little very lightweight build server, very lightweight deployment server. There's an interesting consequence of this architecture, which is since you're running all these CLIs against these repos and you can just run the CLI locally and it should build it and it should package it and it should deploy it, creating CI on the, the server side, right, as a result of, of somebody pushing code is just go run those same CLI commands. So you CI, our, our, our man, the manifest is the build script. And, and there isn't really any script in it. It's just, hey, you have these kinds of technologies. I can look at them and look in the manifest and, and there's this little tiny bit of dependency between facets. That's all you can do. The engine figures that out, says, okay, here's the build tools to run in order. I'm gonna go run those. And on the deployment side, we look at the manifest. We do something a little fancier there, right? Like you could do it kind of a bunch of different ways. We store a bunch of the deployment information in a graph database. And, and then do kind of semantic version resolution so that we figure out the right versions of things to go do deployments and we block deployments if the target environment's not ready. So if you say, hey, I need a Postgres database at version X, right? Like that's all you have to do is express that I need a repository that you know essentially implements that interface. It provides one of those things and, um, and it needs to be named this thing and it has to be at least this version. If that's not in the deployed environment, we know because we keep track of all the manifests that we deploy, right? So there's some other like magic kind of that goes on behind the scenes there. But the, the basics is that it goes very nicely into a graph database, which we then use for deployment controls and, and promotion. Nice. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. And uh, let's give it the last 10 seconds to uh, ask um the last questions you got all the compliments uh very in interesting inspiring and entertaining session so uh, people loved your crazy images <laughs> very good <laughs> that way we can still see your screen by the way uh there yep uh, sure, no worries. Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, your time, for uh, everyone who joined uh, live with us today. I'll make sure we send over the follow-up, the crazy slides Brian has, and uh, also the webinar replay, so you can figure it all out together. Uh, I'll see you guys next week. Next week, we are going to talk about scaling uh, on call with Plio, another great speaker. So if you're interested in this topic, feel free to sign up and join in. And um, well, hope everyone has an amazing end of the day and 
end of the week and great weekend in their countryside or enjoying the city, big city life. And uh, thank you all. Bye. Thank you.